introducing Dr. Kevin Schroeder as the clinical coordinator and lecturer three within the University of New Mexico's professional athletic training program. Prior to his time at UNM, Kevin was the athletic trainer with the 351st Battlefield Airmen Training Squadron. Did I get that right? Wow. Okay, all right. Uh, as Special Operations Group at Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque. Kevin has also previously worked as an athletic trainer with the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, where he worked primarily with combat sports, wrestling, boxing, and judo. He was a member of the 2015 Para Pan Am Games medical staff in Toronto, Canada, and the 2016 Paralympic Games in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, where he worked closely with the Paralympic Judo team. He's also worked in the Arena Football League as well as the NCAA Division I and III levels. Kevin is a graduate from East Carolina University with a Bachelor's of Science in Athletic Training, the University of Pittsburgh with a Master's of Science in Health Rehabilitation and Sports Medicine Sciences, and the University of Idaho with a Doctorate in Athletic Training. He is a Distinguished Practitioner Fellow of the National Academies of Practice. Dr. Kevin Schroeder. All right, good afternoon. So I don't know about you, but uh, groin pain has always been a pain in my butt. It has been the bane of my existence as a clinician, and I've made it my life mission to figure out what to do with it. An athlete walks in, a patient walks in, and says, well, my groin hurts. I just I dreaded it because it could be a million different things. So part of that mission to solve the world's problems of groin pain, here we are. Um, ready, go. There we go. All right, I have nothing to disclose. And so what we'll talk about today, we'll start with some anatomy. We're gonna be really brief with the anatomy. We're in a room full of clinicians. You all have seen all of this stuff before, so I won't spend too much time in it, but I'll point out a few things to remind you. We'll identify some of the symptomology as it relates to groin pain and uh, sport, um, sports hernias. Uh, we'll talk about how to discriminate between these different routes, and we'll talk about the therapy inter interventions that we can apply to help solve some of our problems here. All right, so again, I'm not gonna spend too much time, but we've seen the pelvic girdle once or twice in our day, correct? One thing I wanna point out as we kinda of go through a little bit of this anatomy is that remember the anatomy in the pelvis is, is rather complex, especially when you just look at musculoskeletal neural anatomy. It's not linear, unlike the appendicular skeleton, for example, things tend to run longitudinally, not the case in the pelvis, and this can really create a lot of problems when we're trying to do a quality evaluation of those structures. Oop. Um, you know, we've got deep soft tissues followed by more um, bony tissue, followed by more soft tissues as we kind of move through these things. And again, it's not linear. We've got overlaying uh, connective tissue, contractile tissue present here, which obviously can complicate a lot of things when we're trying to really get nitpicky with what we're looking at here. Um, so again, not linear all different directions. Understanding too that we're coming from deep to superficial, superior to inferior, inferior to superior, all those sorts of things here. Again, more soft tissues that are deeper that are non-contractile uh, and the curvatures there. The other thing too that we need to remember is the complexity of the, of the neural anatomy there. So the caudal equini uh, and the, the uh, nerve roots, especially L1, 2, and 3, and then S1 and S2 is really where we're gonna focus a lot of our discussion today. Um, and the different branches that stem off of L1, 2, 3, S1, S2. And again, too, remember that sciatic nerve. It likes to run either behind, in front of, or right through that iliopsoas area, uh, which again can kind of create its own little set of problems. And sometimes those problems do manifest into the groin. The other thing, too, to remember when we're, when we're palpating, we're evaluating the groin, that that femoral triangle is real close by. And so it's important to realize the anatomy there, the critical, the uh, delicate nature of that anatomy. So the femoral nerve is most lateral, then the artery, and then the vein. Uh, and then it's, a, it's a bordered or outlined by the sartorius, the adductor longus, and the inguinal ligament. All right. As we move through these slides today, remember, we're talking about a chief complaint of groin pain. So we're gonna be all over the place. It's not just musculoskeletal. Um, and I'm not gonna spend too much time on the usual suspects. We've been around long enough. We know that we need to look for adductor strains, um, disc herniations, all that kind of good stuff. I don't wanna focus on that today. We know that. We've been around. 
We've dealt with enough adductor strains in our day to know what's going on. But what I do want to remind you of is the theory of, inter of regional interdependence. And you all know this theory, you just may not know it by that name. And this is the theory that where we're having symptomology manifesting may not be the site of the actual problem. We need to look at remote regions. I've got groin pain, but it could be in the low back that's causing it. Or I've got groin pain, it could be further up or down the kinetic chain. So remember that as you're doing an evaluation. A lot of referral patterns go through the groin. All right, history. Past, present, and what happened? Always the questions, right? That's not new to us. But how many of us are really integrating functional movement assessments into our evaluation? Yeah, we might do it if we suspect it's, it's lower extremity or something like that, but if a patient comes in saying they have low back pain, how many of us are really truly looking at gait or how they're squatting or how they're deadlifting or whatever it may be? So making sure that we are still incorporating gross movement assessments with this evaluation process. I'm not gonna tell you where that needs to go. I'm gonna let you kind of decide that as a clinician because sometimes we don't necessarily think a gross motor movement assessment's necessary. We get down the road, new information comes out. Okay, now I need to go back and maybe do a movement assessment. But make sure that that movement assessment is on your radar, that you know how to do one and do one well and know how to interpret it. There's a few different philosophies out there that are well beyond what we're gonna talk about today, but depending on who you subscribe to, maybe you like FMS, uh, SFMA, Yonda, Sarman, all those, all those uh, people out there. So um, keep that in mind. And then of course there's the usual things with inspections and, and palpating soft tissues, bony tissues, making sure that we're doing posterior, anterior, lateral, medial. Uh, we're getting some outcome measures, range of motion, goniometry, how stable is the joint. And we wanna make sure that we're doing a good quality neuro screening. So if this is something you're not comfortable with, brush up. I wanna make sure that we're doing um, uh, simple things, dermatomes, myotomes, for example, deep tendon reflexes. Those are, those are usual things that I do in my evaluations. It takes two seconds to, to do them out there. Uh, for lower quarter, I'm also gonna throw in Babinski's and Colonus testing. Again, it takes two seconds to do those. Uh, and then uh, making sure that we're looking at the full length of the sciatic nerve for anything that's lower extremity. Vascular, quick capillary refills are great, distal pulses. And of course, we want to incorporate any site-specific uh, special tests, stress tests, along those lines there. All right, common etiologies that we're going to talk about today, if it's athletic-based, which is probably about 90% of what we would see as, as athletic trainers, I'm thinking agility. Agility sports, specifically we're talking about soccer, ice hockey, rugby, um, or the like or muscular imbalances. And we'll talk a little bit more later on about muscular imbalances when we get a little bit later into treatment protocols that are available to, uh, to treat some of these groin-based pathologies. But the other thing we have to talk about too at some point is kind of the more the gen med aspect. And some of you are groaning right now because gen med is the bane of your existence. I love gen med, I think it's wonderful. I wish we did more of it in our profession, but we're gonna talk about some of those things to think about and how to look at them and how to discriminate those versus other uh, uh, etiologies in the gen med realm. All right, slipped capital femoral epiphysis. This is one of those ones that you probably heard in class at some point, but that may have been the only time you really saw it. And so what's happening here is we have the femoral head displaced relative to the femoral neck. And so in this picture here, you can see the x-ray here, uh, but the kind of superimposed below it, you can see the kind of the translation that's occurring here of that femoral head slipping over inferiorly in this case, across that femoral neck. Who do we see this in? Well, think growth plates. Who is my growing population? We could see this in children. That's not usually, or little I, children, I mean like, toddlers, little, little little kids. Not so much a population that we probably treat, but definitely we see a lot of teens in our, in our patient population. So thinking about those that are, that are going through growth patterns, growth spurts especially, and if they're overweight, they're at a much higher risk because of the weight distribution that's being required to go through that, that anatomical neck there. We do see this more in males than females. And what's gonna happen is they're gonna come in and they're gonna say, my groin hurts, yay. And it's been going on or off for about three weeks. And over the course of those three weeks, it's progressively gotten a little bit more worse, a little bit more worse, and a little bit more worse. 
they're gonna have this insidious onset. I don't really know what happened, it just, I kind of woke up and it started to hurt. Our favorite mechanism, right? I don't know. Um, and then there's gonna be something that sets them off. Maybe they stepped off the curb wrong or they kicked a soccer ball wrong or something and it's gonna say, okay, this is the point now where I need to get looked at and they're gonna come knocking on your door and you're gonna say, come on in and you're gonna look at them. Now here's the tricky part. I don't know about you, but I don't have an x-ray hanging out in my clinic. So we have to be very highly suspicious of what's going on here because if this is unstable, this could be very dangerous. So if I'm suspecting this, I'm gonna put them on crutches, immediately non-weight bearing, and you're going to go get x-rays and I'm calling up my team doc or my ortho or whoever. What's gonna bleed me down this road is they're gonna have very painful, limited internal rotation of the hip and they're gonna be walking in with a limp. If it happens to be bilateral, which is not common by the way, but if it does, they're gonna waddle in. And you're gonna be like, what happened? You're like, I don't know. Uh, and again, that's very generalized, diffused kind of pain that's occurring here that's a little bit more sharp going through that groin region. Ready, go. All right, again, immediate referral needed. We wanna get them not non-weight bearing, get them in crutches, make sure they understand it's important not to be crutched. Now, if you know it's, it's late after hours, this isn't, I, I need to send them right away to the ER, but I'm calling out my team doctor, maybe get them in that next morning, and they really need to understand that non-weight bearing um, uh, discussion. We're talking surgery here, we wanna surgically intervene here, we need to make that stable. If not, we're looking at avascular necrosis of that, of that femoral head and or the anatomical neck of the, the uh, of the femur, or some kind of uh, chondrolytic uh, death is gonna start occurring. The, the chondral coverings of the, uh, of the bones will start to necrosis. <laughs> Similarly, something else we may have talked about in class but maybe never have seen, leg calf Perth disease. So we, we don't have a great understanding of how this manifests. But what we do know is that we start to see lesions forming usually early on in the first decade of life. So by the time they're 10, they might have some spotting on the, on the bone around the, the femoral head. And what this, is, what this is showing is that there's starting to be kind of this malformation of the head of the femur. And over time, instead of it being nice and round and smooth, it starts to plateau and flatten off. They're still functional, they can move. It may not be the most quality movement, but they can do it. And if this isn't addressed, what this is gonna look like is severe debilitating osteoarthritis by the time they're 60. Uh, whether or not this is one traumatic event versus multiple micro traumas over the course of several months, years, whatever it may be, is, is anyone's question, the, the research is kind of out on that. But what we're worried about here is the blood supply and that avascular necrosis could be occurring here. What we've identified as risk factors is smoking, specifically talking about maternal smoking during pregnancy or exposure to secondhand smoke early on. Uh, blood clotting factors, if they have a history of blood clotting disorders, I'm concerned more about like half birth disease than the average person. Uh, similarly, thyroid disease or any kind of endocrine disease could lead to this as well. And for whatever reason, we do see this more in males than females. How do we find it? Um, Again, groin pain, <laughs> shocking. Buttock and medial thigh pain as well. We might also have some super patellar pain because think about that L3 dermatome goes down that way and so we can kind of follow that, that referral pattern. What we'll see here too is there's an antalgic gait. So they have some kind of abnormal gait. It may not be recognizable by one of the ones that we recognize, but something is off. If we do a Trendelenburg stance, we'll see that, that hip drop, so a positive Trendelenburg's test and decreased abduction interrotation um, of the hip, especially when they're in an extended position of the hip as well. Early on, we'll see this present, pre uh, present with uh, muscle spasms, maybe some synovitis type of symptomology. As it starts to progress and gets later on, we'll start to see that bone degeneration, that osteoarthritis. How do we treat it? Well, it's a little weird. Um, we wanna maintain as much quality range of motion as possible. And again, we're talking about little kids here, so we can do something called uh, petrique casting, which is where we want to essentially cast them in an abducted position. Uh, these casts are removable. They're, the reason that they're removable is so that they can continue on through, through rehabilitation exercises and whatnot, but most of the time they want these patients to stay in this casting. So they move them around, they ambulate through wheelchair, uh, but the idea is that in abduction, the majority of the femoral head is rotated into that uh, acetabular fossa. So it helps to kind of keep and maintain and shape it to be as round as possible. 
they can be in these casts for upwards of six months, sometimes longer. So this is not a quick thing, not a quick fix. It's obviously not something that's very conducive to uh, ADLs, but it is necessary for quality of life long term. From a surgical perspective, it may help, it may not. There's not clear data as to why some individuals, some children respond well and others don't, but it is an option if, uh, if casting isn't working. All right, hip labral tears. Um, I don't know about you, but I have seen more of these than I care to ever see again, and if I never see another one again, I'd be just fine with it. But these are a pain. Um, so the trauma, there's usually not a major traumatic event. Um, I used to work with women's wrestling extensively, and they would be the ones that seem to have a real traumatic event. They realize that they're, especially with the extension and some kind of internal or external hyper rotational force, and they would feel something kind of go in the hip. But more times than not, they're not going to have a, a rememberable incident in this case. So what were things we're looking at is femoral acetabular impingement, hypermobility, dysplasia, degeneration. The list kind of goes on as far as kind of risk factors preceding labral tears. And what they're going to complain of is this localized, dull, throbbing type of pain with sporadic, sharp um, uh, jolts. And that's probably from the instability and muscle guarding trying to pull that, that femoral head back kind of into place. They may they probably have some kind of clicking sensation similar to that of like a meniscal tear of the knee. It's just gonna be in the hip where it'll feel like it locks and it might give out. Uh, they, they are a fall risk at that point in time too if they do have that history, so it is something to keep in mind. How do we look at these? How do we kind of diagnose these? We use a clock face, so depending on the imaging, where it falls on the clock face kind of gives us a little bit of a, of a tell of where we need to look for the tear and how we need to address it. So from six to 12, we're looking more anterior-based tears in the labrum, and that 12 to six is that more that posterior tear when we're looking at this from an MRI imaging perspective. Uh, anterior tears, hip flexion, internal rotation, and abduction are, are my problematic positions versus posterior, it's hip flexion, internal rotation, and posterior loading. So how can we look? Get them into favors. Get them non-bearing, get them supine, put them into favors position. That'll give you a little bit of a, it's not gonna be super definitive, but this is, if I'm thinking labral tear and I get them into favors, they're not gonna like this, especially if you get them in that position and really try to force that abduction and external rotation. Uh, scouring test, uh, you can do it. They're already kind of supine, so might as well, right? But don't put a lot of faith in it. Um, again, there's, a, there's a, a compressive axial loading component to this that seems to be a little bit more prominent when they're lighting up. So you're losing that when you have them supine. This is, these are tricky to, to kind of identify, um, even with imaging, it's tricky. So usually what they do is an MRA, uh, so they, they use a contrast dye to inject into the joint space. With that though, is actually a little kind of an interesting thing that's been noticed is, with that dye, usually there's a local anesthetic, a lidocaine, for example, and if that helps to numb the pain and they're good for a little while after, we're thinking there might be some kind of intraarticular defect present as well or in lieu of an actual labral tear. So that's something to pay attention to. Uh, but otherwise, the dye is supposed to kind of help light up some of those tears and those less uh, vascularized tissues like the labrum. So from a treatment perspective, we can try rehab, try some therapeutic exercises, promoting normal movement patterns. So we want to train them to move properly, but also we want to limit that they're not going into extreme flexion extension and internal external rotation. But let's be honest, it's sport. It's not going to probably happen. So this is, by and large, very unsuccessful in athletic populations. So then we went to a surgical route. And then there's the question, of do you repair it or you try to resect the tear in the, in the labrum? Uh, and similar to the kind of the knee, if there's, a, if there's a decent amount of blood supply to the area, they'll try to repair it. But if not, they'll just go ahead and resect it. Resecting, we really want to try to avoid as much as possible because now we have a little hole in our suction cup that is the labrum. And so we're going to have lifelong instability of that hip to the point where it could potentially be debilitating or exclude them from the ability to continue to participate in sport if it's bad enough. All right, osteitis pubis, um, inflammation of the, uh, the, the pubic symphysis. I'm thinking agility sports, sports where there's a lot of rotation, shearing forces. Acutely speaking, if this occurs, there's a fracture. 
not pretty common, at least not isolated, or I'm going to know there's some kind of major trauma going on. It's not going to be my concern that you have osteitis pubis. If you have a pelvic trauma, I'm going to be thinking of a lot of other things I'm more concerned about. Uh, but more of those chronic cases that come in, um, again, agility sports, uh, running, kicking, cutting, whatever it is. And with that, there's going to be some spasmatic activity or pain in the lower abdominals, in the adductors, around that pubic symphysis. Um, so how do we treat it? Core stabilization is a great way that you can try. Um, Pilates is a really great option for uh, those with uh, osteitis pubis. Gradual return to play. If that's not working, we can go with the cortisone injection, but I would really try to avoid that because that's just not a fun place to stick a needle. Uh, and if it's really super uncooperative, now we're looking at surgical intervention where they actually try to go in and, and fixate the, the pubic symphysis to have minimize that movement. All right. Athletic pubalgia, sports hernias, um, these are challenging. In fact, they're challenging enough that there's some clinicians out there who don't necessarily believe that these truly exist. Um, they're hard to image. They're hard to visualize through just about any form of imaging that we have. What's occurring here, at least what's uh, theorized to occur is that we've got some kind of chronic lower abdominal groin pain manifestation from this mismatched uh, movement of soft tissues. There's usually some kind of athletic-based etiology where this, through the, the patient remembers I was doing a drill and I, I felt something. I can't really describe it. It's just kind of this deep, achy pain somewhere in the lower pelvic region. Um, you have to be very meticulous with your physical exam to the point where you've got to really pretty much rule out everything else before you can kind of land on the idea that there might be a sports hernia or athletic pubalgia present. So again, knowing that anatomy, knowing what's going on, meticulous history, do they don't have anything else going on, uh, really looking at that pubic symphysis, is it, is it moving abnormally, is that really more of my problem? Um, again, muscular attachments, we've got transverse, we've got internal and external obliques all going at, at, at angles, we've got the rectus abdominis going more in a vertical uh, fiber alignment, we've got the conjoined tendon pre presence. So there's a lot of shearing forces going through this region, which is partly what makes this challenging to not only diagnose, but when we get to treatment, talking about how do you limit muscle activation in the pelvis, and you really can't. Again, gradual onset, unless there's some kind of traumatic injury, they're gonna say it just kind of gradually came on, especially with um, starting with adductor pain, that groin pain, and then moving up into the lower abdominal region. They probably have a history of playing some type of agility sport, soccer, ice hockey, rugby, Australian rules, football. We do see this more in males than females, and usually the symptomology is unilateral. Uh, but there was one study that showed that 43% of individuals did have bilateral symptoms. It didn't mean that they necessarily had a tear bilaterally, but their symptomology was presenting bilaterally. One of the things, though, that we, we kind of dismiss sometimes when we're doing an evaluation of the, the region is this increase of pain with cough. And this is something I want you to pay attention to if you've got a patient presenting with this kind of insidious athletic pubalgia kind of, of of presentation here. So they'll have some kind of radiating or shooting pain down through the groin, the thigh, the testicle region if they're male. Thinking kind of that L1, L2 distribution, dermatome, myotome distribution, um, that is painful with cough. It can be painful without cough, but the pain increases with cough. Uh, and then if there's prolonged sitting or prolonged flexion, abduction, torsional, rotational types of activities, that pain will become more deep uh, and will seem to present a little bit more lateral. Um, again, remember that theory of inter regional interdependence where the, where the side of the pain may not be the actual place of manifestation of the area that I need to correct. So that's something that you need to keep in mind as you go through here. Um, I could have uh, adductors, especially the adductor longus and gracilis and the pectineus, are going to be the most tender with palpation, so really being able to discriminate between your different muscular regions there. Uh, pubic symphysis, pubic tubercles are painful in about 22% of patients, so one in five. So don't put a whole lot of faith in it, but don't dismiss it. Uh, again, Valsalva may or may not work, but that forced cough because of that muscular activation uh, with it can sometimes uh, 
perk up the pain there. And then looking at full hip range of motion and, and looking at where are they limited and is that related to joint problem or is it more regional interdependence kind of core tissue problems here? And how can we look? Have them do a sit up, have them do a crunch. I have them go straight up first, do a, do a crunch first. If that's okay, let's do a sit up because the sit up is going to be a little bit more lower. And then we can go into the obliques and see if that manifests everything. It's not an end all be all, but it, it can kind of help point you in that direction there. Your imaging, your, your plain radiographs, your x-rays aren't going to show anything, right? We know that. But to get to the good stuff, most insurances require us to get a set of x-rays. So plain films, AP and a lateral, you can have them standing, you can have them prone, it doesn't really matter. Um, see if you see anything. This is, if anything, is helpful just to kind of rule out some of that hip joint pathology that we'd be concerned about. But I'm really waiting for to see this MRI and see if this MRI shows me anything here. I might see some partial thickness or full thickness tearing, some uh, FAI or stress fracture reactions, synovial disorders, osteonecrosis, malignancies, myotennis junction, bursitis, the list goes on. Again, thinking about that this is a diagnosis of exclusion. I've got to rule out all this other stuff before I can start really entertaining the idea that this is a sports hernia. Uh, injections, we can, we can try to kind of diagnostically inject them with some kind of local anesthetic to see if that helps. We would do that under fluoroscopy or an ultrasound guided injection. Again, it's not going to necessarily say that this is a sports hernia, but it can help us rule out some of that other stuff that might be lingering. Non-surgical therapeutic exercises, thinking about core stabilization, pelvic floor stabilization is a big one, uh, and we want to normalize hip range of motion and control. There's not a whole lot of research out there, though, that really supports, well, or really refutes therapeutic interventions here. But again, there's still controversy as to even if these exist, and if they do exist, how do we truly define them? There's some ebbing and flowing as far as the definition goes. So what can we do? Well, uh, there is the Copenhagen Protocol. Uh, sometimes it's called the, the Copenhagen Groin Protocol or the Adductor Protocol. I'm showing here the modified version. I like the modified version better than the original version. Um, the original version, I think, only had three steps. This has six. But what the idea here is, is that you are putting the adductors onto a gravity-resistant uh, position here. So we're going to put the um, affected side on top, and we're going to have them work their way into a... Uh, adductor midline type of protocol here. So the, the QR code, if you scan, it'll take you to this article. I think it did a nice job of outlining the modified version here. But basically what they do is the patient lays on their side. Again, the affected side is up and they'll start with about a foot high jump box. And what they're trying to do is just isometrically contract the adductors against that. And once they're able to do that pretty easily, pretty successfully, then we'll move up onto level two. Uh, supporting their leg, and they want to bring their bottom leg up towards the top leg. So now we're trying to get that true adduction uh, motion there. And then we'll move up into an iso hold where we'll just kind of uh, lengthen the lever arm position. So maybe instead of having the box close to the knee, now we're going to push it more closer to the ankle. Longer lever arms, it's harder for the body to perform those movements. And we'll progress all the way up to the point where you actually have a, a partner holding the leg up at an increased angle and they try to bring that bottom leg up to it. So some of these, if you do these in one day, they might get to level one, two, maybe even three in one day, and then you really have to work on either strengthening or learning, teaching them how to activate those musculatures in those positions. And there's a lot of great outcomes with, with completing uh, uh, this Copenhagen protocol, even as a uh, preventative measure. If you've got a team that's just notorious for having a lot of adductor groin pain problems, this is a great kind of uh, preventative protocol to just kind of throw at them. What we're looking for, though, ultimately, is, is our strength ratios left to right. So our outcomes, what do we look like left to right? And what you want to see, you actually do want to see a little bit of a mismatch. You don't want them to be perfectly the same left to right. We want to have the dominant leg, whatever that patient decides is dominant, a little bit stronger, about 18 to 22% stronger than the non-dominant. And remember when we talk about dominant sides, it's not just assuming that, okay, they're right-handed, so they're right-legged, or they're left-handed, they're left-legged. Ask them. We know in baseball we got switch hitters, right? Combat left, combat right, or I throw left and I bat right, or whatever it is. So ask your patients what's your dominant leg, and they may not they may not know. So I would say ask them if I were to throw a soccer ball at you right now, what foot would you instinctively kick it with? 
And that's the one that I want to work on and making sure that it's a little bit stronger than the left. Surgically speaking, again, you're going to see different philosophies out there. You're going to see different um, uh, opinions out there depending on where, where is the problem at, what kind of problem do we have, do we subscribe to the traditional definition of a sports hernia, et cetera. So this is something that's kind of the, more the surgeon's discretion than anything else. But um, with that, depending on the technique, might dictate your protocol as far as uh, the rehab goes post-op. So there's a EO, uh, external oblique, transverse abdominis, and transversalis fascial mesh uh, repair, laparoscopic repairs, mini open repairs, pelvic floor repairs, and with those you could have with or without adductor releases, neurectomies where they actually go in and kind of deaden the nerve. But again, there's some challenges with just diagnosing and agreeing upon what truly is going on. So it's, I won't say it's common, but it's not uncommon to see these surgeries not provide a whole lot of relief to sometimes, unfortunately. All right, let's switch gears a little bit. So let's take more of that gen med kind of focus and look kind of outside of the traditional musculoskeletal neural uh, um, lens that we've been looking at from here. All right, appendicitis. We know about it. We've heard about it. We know McBurney's point. Maybe that's all we know. That's okay. So remember, the appendix lives in that lower, um, lower right quadrant. And uh, why does it manifest? Well, there's a little bit of argument there as well, but we think that there is something to do with some kind of infectious agent, viral, bacterial, maybe even a parasite, um, and, or that there's some kind of obstruction occurring to the, uh, the lumen space of the appendix itself, since the appendix is a little bit of a little sack pouch at the end of the, uh, the colon there. So it could be a tumor, it could be a, a a colon stone, an abscess, anything like that. So what's going to happen here is they're going to come in, they probably will have lower right quadrant pain, maybe they'll have some sign symptoms of an infection, so fever, nausea, vomiting, sweating, all that kind of good stuff. McBurney's point will be positive, so let's remember McBurney's point, it's one half to one third the distance from the ASIS moving towards the umbilicus, and we'll see that being painful with rebound tenderness. So as we flat hand palpate, the pain would go away, as we lift up, that pain is gonna resurface. Similarly is, is a Rob Singh's sign, which is where we actually start to see lower right quadrant pain when we palpate the contralateral, contralateral side, the left side. And the thought here is that as you palpate that lower left quadrant, you're pushing abdominal contents towards the right, puts pressure on the appendix, patient doesn't like that, thus the pain. Not as common, Dunphy's sign, but that's where that's almost like a Valsalva there's that increased pain with the cough there. Uh, lower abdominal or groin pain is gonna occur too sometimes with walking, walking or coughing. So groin pain, although not common, it can occur here. How do we treat it? Or before we treat it, let's talk about some lab testing quick. Uh, we'll get blood work, CBC. We wanna look and see the white blood count. Is it elevated? Elevated white blood cells traditionally means there's some kind of infection going on. Uh, similarly, elevated C-reactive proteins are gonna be uh, present. And what are we gonna do about it? Well, if we have time, if this isn't like imminently about to rupture, uh, a CT scan isn't a bad option, but we know that CT scans aren't quick. Uh, it can take some time, but this does have some of the better accuracy comparatively speaking to say MRIs, which are very difficult to interpret and challenging uh, to, or excuse me, more expensive to uh, administer. Ultrasound is another bad option. It's, it can do a point of care. Uh, it's relatively inexpensive. It's easy to interpret. Um, and we have some pretty solid diagnostic criteria there with the ultrasound. So what do we do? Well, we're gonna remove the appendix. So laparoscopic's preferred as long as it's not complicated. We talk about uncomplicated versus complicated appendicitis. Uncomplicated means it hasn't ruptured. It's still intact. I don't suspect any malignancies or any widespread tissue issues beyond the appendix. It's all still isolated in the appendix. It's easy, we can go in, cut the appendix, get out, suture them up. Usually they're home in 24, 48 hours. Um, it gets complicated when their appendix ruptures or if we catch a malignancy and we've got some widespread tissue problems here. We've got fecal matter now that's present throughout the, the abdominal cavity. So then that's a little bit of a different story. We'll probably have to open up the abdominal cavity there and flush it out, lavage, all that kind of good stuff. Then there's this idea of antibiotic therapy. This was uh, being studied pretty extensively probably about 15, 10, 15 years ago. It never really caught on because the thought was well, if most of the time the etiology is from some kind of infectious agent, most of the time they found it to be bacterial, 
why not try to shock the system with antibiotics, right? Makes sense. And what they found is it, it, it kind of worked. Um, but about 23, 25% of patients still had to end up having their appendix removed within a year. So the kind of the gold standard is still to go in laparoscopically and remove it um, so long as um, there's no other complications going on. Diverticulosis, this is challenging. This isn't something that we're necessarily going to easily diagnose clinically. This is going to be something where we've tried our tricks that we can do in, in our athletic training facility. Still not getting better. We're going to probably refer them out. But this can manifest with lower abdominal groin pain, sometimes even buttock pain. What we're, to, what we're seeing here is through routine colonoscopy usually, um, there are outwarding bulging pockets of swollen uh, colon tissue. Typically see this in older individuals, 60 years plus. So into that realm where we're doing routine colonoscopies once a year, or I'm sorry, once a decade, not once a year, that would be terrible. Um, <laughs> we don't really well understand the etiology, but we do know that there's a high association with types of food. And people that have diverticulosis uh, usually can pick up on the triggers once they figure out what food they are and they remove those triggers. They're usually okay, but they're usually more dense foods that don't digest very well. Think of seeds, small nuts, um, corn even sometimes. They just don't digest well sometimes. But risk factors to increase this, smoking, obesity, low fiber, low vegetables, fruits, red meats, NSAIDs, uh, all the fun stuff, I guess. Um, but again, thinking about bloating, belly pain, groin pain, lower abdominal pain, buttock pain, diarrhea, constipation, so all those typical lower GI types of symptomology are going to be present, which can mean a million different things, right? Um, and so we can get a CT, we'll get a colonoscopy, usually the colonoscopy is kind of the, the gold standard for really getting at the bottom of this. Uh, we can see some labs, sometimes our labs will show some inflammatory markers, but they're nearly nonspecific, so it's not going to say this is elevated, therefore it is diverticulosis. Um, we might even do a lower GI x-ray series because we might be able to see some of those more dense uh, foods, the seeds, for example, being uh, collecting or, or sticking in those pockets and getting stuck. Um, so what do we do? Well, we avoid the triggers. We avoid the foods. Um, even foods like cucumbers. We don't think of cucumbers as having seeds, right? It's very watery. It's very mellow as far as the taste goes. It's not something we think of, but they do have seeds, and those seeds are not well digested sometimes in individuals, so avoiding those. All right, Crohn's disease. This is inflammation of the GI tract, more specifically working more towards the end or the terminal end of the small intestines and into the colon, but it really technically could be anywhere along the small and the large intestines. Uh, there is a genetic association, a familial history association here. So if there's a family history, I'm going to have a little bit of a higher suspicion here. But the true etiology here is really unknown. We, we're kind of settled on that it's, it's got some kind of autoimmune types of responses and characteristics, so we treat it as such. And a lot of people do pretty well on those types of, of, uh, of treatments here. But the big thing here is, is making sure that if we do have a flare-up, because this will kind of flare up and then go into remission, ebb and flow over time, but making sure we recognize triggers if we're able to, cutting those triggers out. Um, the easily, most easily controllable ones are foods, and those foods can vary from person to person. Um, but making sure that other things aren't manifesting as a cause of it. So things like fistulas, where we have ir irregular unions between tissues that shouldn't be connecting, uh, abscesses, fissures, ulcerations occurring, malnutrition because of the lack of absorption of the nutrients that can occur. They could be susceptible to some malnutrition that we wouldn't normally see in a in a third world type of country, um, or inflammation in other parts of the body. And there, if you look at that list of, of symptoms, again, they're very generic as far as GI goes. That just tells me that the GI system isn't happy. It doesn't really tell me that what's really going on, except for the skin changes. Those tend to be a little bit more unique to Crohn's disease. So that erythematic representation and these little bumps or papules that'll sometimes pop up that are tender. So lab tests, stool tests is another big one. They'll look at uh, markers in, in stool. Uh, colonoscopy is another uh, kind of gold standard there that they'll look at. Um, CTs, upper GI series, they'll do an endoscopy sometimes to look at the upper levels to make sure that this isn't beyond the colon and the small intestines. How do we treat it? Again, beyond kind of the lifestyle changes and recognizing the food, we're, we're looking at medications here. So we could do symptomatic treatments with NSAIDs and anti-diarrheas. NSAIDs, though, tend to upset the GI system, so it can be kind of counterintuitive there. But anti-diarrheas, your uh, lotomeds or um, imodiums are, are options as well. Those are usually well-tolerated by these patients. 
antibiotics, the tissue's inflamed, it's going to be open. We're in the GI tract, there's a lot of bacteria, easily a place for infection to occur that can cause some more sepsis types of responses. And then there's immune system uh, suppressants, things like biologics, for example. Um, if it gets really bad, you know, bowel rest isn't working where we try to just really kind of either cut out food for 24, 48 hours if we can, or just kind of do more of like a brat diet, a really bland, no spice, no anything, just kind of white grain sort of a deal. We might have to get down to, the, to a feeding tube. Now this isn't common, but it can happen from time to time. And then of course surgery, if that tissue is necrotic or it's becoming irreparable, they actually can resect some of the bowel. All right, ulcerative colitis, similar but not. So this is really just in the colon and the large intestines. What's occurring here is manifestation of, of ulcers inside of the, the, uh, the colon's lining. Again, lower abdominal pain that can radiate down into the uh, lower pelvis, uh, adductor region, sometimes into the buttocks. We don't really understand why, but we similar kind of idea that it might have some kind of autoimmune disease, some kind of similar manifestation as we see with Crohn's disease. Usually we see this onset before the age of 30, but we know that it can happen. Um, and then symptomology, diarrhea, uh, often with, with visible pus or discharge, that's, that's not normal. So again, thinking about that ulceration, that tissue's not healthy, it's more susceptible to infection. Pus can be a sign of that infection, so we could sometimes see that being discharged there. Blood too, not necessarily to the point where we see kind of that, that used coffee ground uh, clotting of blood, but but could be sometimes. Um, again, rectal uh, or abdominal pain, uh, including the groin. And there's another uh, unique aspect, this urgency to defecate, but they can't go. They feel like they need to go. It comes and goes. It's that spasmatic pressure that, that the bowel wants to do something. It's moving, but it doesn't have anything to actually push out. Um, Lab tests, same idea. We're looking at uh, inflammatory markers. Is there any signs for infections there? We'll do an x-ray series, see if there's any kind of blockage in the intestines. Uh, CT, MRI, colonoscopy are kind of the gold standards there. Um, Anti-inflammatories, corticosteroids are big. Other immune suppressants, biologics. Biologics work by targeting key proteins um, that are kind of influencing, excuse me, that uh, uh, inflammatory marker response there, so that's how those kind of work. And then, of course, the symptomatic pain, but again, understanding that some of these anti-inflammatories that are over the counter, your NSAIDs, can be triggering to GI upset. And then again, if it's bad enough that the part of the, the colon has died, they can all go in and resect part of it and take some of it out. All right, UTIs, very common. We see these a lot, our college athletes, especially our college populations. We see this a lot. This is usually from E. coli, although it's not the only uh, entity that can cause uh, UTIs. What we're concerned about is if that UTI makes its way up to the bladder. And that's not uncommon in females because of the length of the urethra. It's very short. But if I have a UTI in a male patient, I am very concerned about what's going on. The length of that urethra should really prohibit a UTI from occurring. So if I have a male presenting with UTI, I want to get that worked up. That's an automatic referral to urology. We need to figure out what's going on. Of course, we're going to treat the, the infection in the meantime. We'll get my team doc or whoever, primary care doc, whatever, to, to get some antibiotics. And, but I want to get that worked up because that can be, there, there's something bigger probably going on that we need to investigate. Um, how do we just diagnose that? We can do a clean catch UA. So have them start to urinate midstream. We'll put the cup under, get about three quarters of the cup full, cap it off. They can urinate the rest of the way out. And we'll check that for any kind of white blood cell count or any kind of bacterial present. Sometimes it's important to get that bacterial present, especially if it's an abnormal case, because we don't want to make sure we don't miss and just assume it's, say, it's E. coli and it ends up being something different. So that might be the case here. How do we treat it? Sulfa drugs are huge, but we have a lot of allergies to sulfa. So the other option is fluoroquinolines. The problem with fluoroquinolines is they tend to disrupt a tendon matrix and cause a lot of tendon ruptures in athletically active individuals which is a problem for us, because we deal with a lot of actively in, uh, active individuals. So we really try to avoid fluoroquinolones if possible, but if that's our only option, then we would just need to remove them from activity while they're on that medication. All right. We're gonna talk a little bit about testicular pathologies, testicular pain. Um, obviously, this is a very 
kind of easy way to, uh, to visualize how groin pain can manifest. So let's talk about a few of these. Uh, we won't talk about all these, but we'll talk about a few of them. So testicular torsion. Um, this is where the testicle actually starts to twist inside of the scrotum to the point where it actually cuts off blood flow to the testicle itself. It's going to be sudden onset. They're going to feel it. Um, there may be or may not be a direct blow kind of mechanism here. Um, unilateral pain. There's going to be nausea for sure, maybe vomiting. Um, what you're going to notice is that the testicle may not be sitting up and down. It may be or oriented horizontally. And it's going to be probably sitting up a little bit higher than it should be. So you may not know where it should be sitting as the, as the provider, but that patient probably knows what looks normal. So it's not uncommon for me to say, go in the bathroom, check it. Does it look normal to you? Does it feel normal to you? And that's usually all I need to do. And that's enough information for you to know that you need to go away or we can look and see if this is something different. One thing you can do is called the cremostatic reflex. And so this is a, a uh, innate reflex that occurs where if you pinch kind of the, the adductor region as it starts to go into the pelvis, um, the testicle on that side should kind of elevate a little bit, kind of jump up. But if it's already twisted and elevated, it's not going to go anywhere. So that's a sign to me that this is, this is problematic. Um, the absence of that, of that is, is indicative of a torsion which means, again, go away, go away, wear a mask, get your booster shot, whatever, but go to the ER, because I can't do anything for you. We need to get this untwisted to save the testicle. Um, how, do they, how do you identify it beyond our clinical setting? They can do an ultrasound, it's really easy, really quick. They'll put on the Doppler, so if you look at this ultrasound image here on the right side of your screen, which is the left testicle, we see blood flow. We see arteries, we see veins, they're active, they're exchanging blood flow routinely as we should expect. On the left side, which is the right testicle, that's absent. That to me tells me that there's something going on. There's an occlusion to the blood supply to, the, to that testicle. Um, usually six hours or less, if we get it untwisted, it's salvageable. Beyond that, we're, it's a gray zone. We get to 12 hours, it ain't good. We're gonna have to resect it, turn, take it out, put in a prosthetic. Um, there is a way to uh, non-surgically untwist it. I don't recommend this for us per se as athletic trainers. We can just, you know, go on your merry way to the ED. But if you're in a place where you can't, you can't get to it, you can't get them to the ED. I don't know. Maybe you're hiking out in the woods somewhere, whatever. Uh, you can do this. The kind of the motion is usually you go um, lateral to medial. That's because that's usually it usually twists medial to lateral. So you want to go the opposite direction, and you want to hold your fingers as if you're going to turn the page of a book and kind of just hold the testicle as you try to flip it inside the scrotal sac there. Again, I don't recommend that, but if you're in a pinch for whatever reason, you can try it. Uh, again, if it's not successful and we're not in a timely manner, they'll have to actually remove the testicle. They'll put in an implant. Um, now, FYI, males are still, it's not a fertility issue with one testicle gone. Most, most males are still able to produce enough sperm for children and all that stuff later on, but um, we don't want to run the risk if we can avoid it. So go away. Goodbye. Have fun at the ER. All right. Hydroseals. This is where we have a fluid buildup between the different layers of tissue in the, in the uh, scrotal sac and the testicle here. Um, these are common in congenitally. They're, a lot of babies can be born with this sometimes or early on. Uh, not a big deal. These can be treated very, very easily. Um, in older, I shouldn't say older people because that's not true, but... Uh, Teenagers, adolescents, college-age individuals, where we tend to see these also occur, these will usually self-resolve. They're kind of unsightly. The testicle will look swollen, but they're not dangerous usually. Um, if there is a question of fertility for some reason, then they'll usually go in and, and not mess around with it. They'll just go ahead and try to resect or drain the, the hydroseal. But if it's, if it's not really a question, they'll leave it alone. It's more of a cosmetic type of thing at that point in time. And most of these resolve within six months. Um, communicating versus non-communicating is just really effective, whether it's just the testicle itself or it's the testicle and the supplying cord, so the spermatic cord, the veins, the arteries that help supply it are involved or not. It doesn't really change the treatment. Um, we can look at this through translumination, um, shining the, a light through the scrotum to see if it's more opaque in some areas and not would be kind of an indication that we've got a hydroseal. So this is a surgical intervention. There's not a whole lot we can do, but again, it's not anything dangerous. I'm not running to the ER. This is a, we can call primary care, see what they think, or, or have them, the urology would do the surgery if that was the case. 
Varicoceles, these are another thing that's not really dangerous, but what we're looking at here is the, the venous complex or the plexus that supplies the testicle is swollen. These are similar to kind of varicose veins. Um, what the patient will say is that it feels like a bag of worms when they palpate it. Again, not really an issue. It's, it's what's happening here is the valves inside the veins are just not closing and opening properly, so there's a little bit of backup, and so they grow in size. Um, again, we don't really touch this unless there's a fertility issue. All right, so some take-home points here. Groin pain, while superficially is pretty straightforward, is clearly not. There's a whole lot of things we need to think about and go on, and there's not a lot of definitive answers. Sometimes we have to kind of do trial and error to kind of figure out what's going on here. Uh, you got to be comfortable with your anatomy, period, right? We know the anatomy is complex in this region. Uh, sports hernias are, have a complex etiology and pathophysiology need to be addressed thoroughly and recognize when it's time to refer. And with that, Duncan, Teddy, and I thank you for your attention and we'll welcome any questions. Thanks, Doc. Did a great job uh, with the presentation, always having us think outside of the box on growing pain, so appreciate that. Um, when you had talked about, um, you know, we've seen like a lot of things within the, the rehabilitation aspect of things change as opposed to surgery outcomes, and I saw that you kind of addressed that within the labral tear aspect of it. Um, when you do have a labral pathology that's involved, um, like a flap or a clicking or anything mm -hmm. of that nature, um, it, it was interesting for you to, to point out that it obviously compromises the suction that we have from the labrum what do we consider more important at that point, right? Because if that's obviously an ailment that's considering a lot of problem in our athlete, uh, what, are we, what are we to do with rehab? Stick them in an abduction brace for six months? Yeah, so this is, this is the challenging thing because you're gonna see a lot of variations in surgical techniques and with that, a lot of variations with rehab techniques that you do. So if you are, I would encourage you to really get to know your surgeon, your hip surgeon in this case, because what one surgeon does is gonna potentially be very similar or very different than the next. And really understand, and I will say in my experience, the first six weeks post-op for hip labral tears are critical. You better follow that protocol to the T because if you screw something up, you can risk re-tearing it and you start the whole process over again. But it, I've seen so many variations in post-op rehab protocols for labrums. I don't, I don't really deviate until I have permission from that surgeon to deviate. And then usually by then it's, it's, you know, we're starting to do ambulation without the use of any kind of bracing or range of motion limitations like that. When they're out of that brace, that's usually when the surgeon's like, okay, you can start to kind of progress them as you see tolerated. Up until then, the protocols I've always seen have been very like, do not deviate. There's, it's a very cookbook approach, which sometimes is nice sometimes it's not so that's that would be my thing is have that conversation with that surgeon and know what you're allowed to deviate from and not yes um, along lines of labral tear do any of your surgeons do labral reconstruction instead of repair I have um, no not not mine if if um, the bulk of what I saw was at the Olympic Training Center. So if you couldn't wrestle anymore, you were, you were gone. Um, so I can't probably sp I can't speak too well on the reconstruction. I'm sorry. Hey, Dr. Schroeder, uh, have you noticed any findings uh, that parallel the muscle skeletal or the pathoanatomics you talked about from a mechanical standpoint, specifically to classification of I'm Those sure, injuries. Yeah, I, I, anecdotally, I'm sure something exists. I can't think of one off the top of my head. But again, this kind of goes back to the how do we define some of these pathologies? It's so am, ambiguous with how they're truly defined that this lies the problem. If you can't define something, how do you study it? How do you how do you reproduce? How do you compare apples to oranges? Kind of a deal. So this is this is kind of the the gap, the identified gap in the literature is we really need to hone in on how we define like sports hernias for example we still we've known they've existed for 20 plus years i think the first 
documented idea of a sports tourney was back in the 80s, but it really wasn't until probably the last 2010s or so that we started to really narrow down a definition, and even then it's still not perfect. So it's, sometimes it's apples to oranges, and you can't even necessarily make that comparison when you read because the authors themselves don't clearly define how maybe they are defining um, uh, what they're looking at, per se. So this is where trial and error kind of comes into play and where I think like patient reported outcomes can really be helpful in this case. How, how do we see this in actual patients in our clinic as opposed to the bench research? So do you think that if you took a classification system and applied it to a specific pathology, you would be able to extrapolate that out? I don't see why not. I think that would be a great idea. It's just, it's just again, man, like figuring out how you define those classifications if you're having a hard time classifying what you're looking at. So. We have time for one more question, and then we need to wrap it up. Yes. Would a pincer lesion present the same way as like a labral tear? I, I, I missed the first part of that. A pincer lesion? Pincer? Oh, lesion. pincer lesion. Yeah, so cam and pincer lesions. Yeah, I, those are ones that we, I kind of skipped over because those are some of the more common ones we see. Absolutely. Um, cam and pincer, though, the nice thing is that usually you can visualize those fairly easily on radiographs um, or uh, a CT scan, for example. But absolutely, from a, and sometimes from a clinical perspective, it's hard to, to discriminate between that and something else. So that's where you can try some of those conservative rehab approaches. If they don't work, referral, get the imaging, know what you're dealing with, and appropriately address it that way. Yeah. Good question. All right. All right. That's all our time. Thank you Thank so you. much.